it's finally here. The season seven finale, episode seven. I'm gonna be talking about loads of spoilers from the episode in this review, so if, and, and probably actually from the rest of the season. So if you haven't caught up yet and you haven't seen this episode, I advise that you click away now. Um, that's absolutely fine. Uh, I know a lot of people are okay with having spoilers and uh, known before they go and watch stuff, but I'm personally not one of those people and know most of the people that I know aren't like that either. So if you don't want any spoilers, click away now. So the first thing we see in the episode is the kind of the, the truce meeting, you know, this uh, this gathering in King's Landing to really kind of hammer out a, 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 to hammer out a truce uh, between Cersei and Daenerys and Jon. Um, what I loved about that is that when the Hound was sort of revealing the white to uh, this crowd of, of, of onlookers who haven't seen a white before, um, Cersei kind of reacts properly to it, which is a really, really big deal because she's always very much She's always very much closed book in terms of her emotions. She keeps her emotions close to her chest and has a brilliant poker face. So the fact that she's properly showing this emotion of, of fear, at, you know, rightfully so, you know, it's, it's a big deal. The Clegane brothers have a little tiff. Uh, you know, Sandor's reminding Gregor of how he's going to die and who, the one, and who is the one who's going to do it. Uh, he doesn't explicitly say exactly who it's going to be, but I think it's pretty... It's, it's safe to assume that it's going to be Sandor next season, I would imagine. So I think we're probably going to see, you know, a, a Clegane off, a Clegane bowl at some point. So um, so that's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, one of them is obviously going to die. Maybe both. I wouldn't... To be honest, I wouldn't be at all surprised if it was the Hound. But again, it's just because I think Game of Thrones is always going to try and surprise us and always kind of shock us in some way. So I'm always assuming the worst. Are we really that surprised that Cersei went back on her word a little bit and lied? I mean, she's basically saying that she's going to hang back with her forces, let Daenerys and Jon's forces go north and take out as many of them as possible uh, before they move south and then they'll have to deal with it. And so she's saying, you know, even if they're successful, they'll have a, like a, a decimated force. And with that, she can go and essentially take back the rest of the country and solidify her place on the Iron Throne. Um, but obviously, if they're unsuccessful, Jamie is absolutely right. They're going to come and kill everyone anyway. Um, and I think it definitely pushes Jamie off the edge. You know, we see him leaving, and this is the reason why. He's rightfully terrified by the threat, and Cersei almost isn't taking it seriously. Or rather, she is taking it seriously, but only when it really comes to affect her directly. The true parentage of Jon is slowly spreading. It's doubled. It's gone from one person to two people. So now Bran Stark knows it. Uh, Samuel Tarly knows it. But the thing is, it's now been confirmed that he's not a bastard. Because even Bran, the one who's supposedly all-seeing, um, is saying, you know, he he's a bastard from Dawn. So he's so he's a Sand. His last name is Sand, uh, and not Snow. Whereas Samuel then basically kind of turns around and says, oh, "Wait, hang on, no," because remembering the fact that, you know, from all of his transcribing of scripts that he's done and hearing Gilly say it back as well, proves that he didn't totally ignore her, thank God, because that really annoyed me. Um, you know, he says, Rhaegar and, Eli uh, Rhaegar and Elia Martell had the marriage annulled by this maester, um, and then Rhaegar and Lyanna Stark then got married in secret, and so when they had the kid, he was legitimate, and that was Jon Snow, or as we now know, Aegon Targaryen, or whatever, like the third or something. Um, I... I'm not sure I like the name Aegon for Jon, but that's only because I've known him as Jon for the entire series. And maybe some people will agree with me on that. Maybe if um, he'd been brought up as a Targaryen and he had silver hair, potentially I'd get on board with the name. But uh, aside from that, I'm not the biggest fan. My favourite bit from the whole episode, and I think a lot of people will agree, will agree with me on this. Peter Baelish, aka Littlefinger, finally bit the dust. I hate that character. Props to Aiden Gillen for playing him so brilliantly because he was very kind of, he was uh, he was a snake. He was just, he was slimy and ah. Um, but you know, he was constantly manipulating people and he finally got his, come up, his comeuppance. And what I love about it is that Bran kind of sowed the seeds of his downfall in a way uh, earlier on in, I think it was the previous episode or the episode before where he says, he quotes back to him his line, chaos is a ladder. You know, sorry, not the previous episode because that was all based in um, uh, Beyond the Wall. But he says, you know, chaos is ladder. He re he repeats this line back to him that he'd said in a previous season, uh, and you could see the look of fear coming over Baelish's face because I doubt he'd ever said that to any other person except for Varys. Um, so with that, he then talks about what exactly Baelish did to betray. Um, their family and you know how he told Ned Stark not to trust him 
and it's it's just it's the funniest thing because then you know Sansa passes the the um, the execution. She gives the order, goes through all the things that he's done, and how he's basically responsible for a bunch of stuff that's gone down and a bunch of people dying. Uh, and then you know Arya takes needle. Whoosh, could have made it more painful, I imagine, but uh, also at the same time it wasn't quick. I mean, as you know, being drained of blood slowly, it probably isn't the best way to go. But anyway, it happened, and I'm happy. Theon going to rescue Yara. I'm pleased that he had his little moment of winning back favor with his people, at least a little bit. But to be honest, that's happened once before in Winterfell, uh, and the people around him ended up betraying him, you know, knocking him over the head and have, you know, letting the Boltons have at him um, once they took Winterfell. So I'm not entirely hopeful. I think maybe, I think Theon or Yara will probably die. I, I'd be more, I'd be less surprised if it was Yara, but honestly, again, last season of Game of Thrones, anything can happen. You know, the, the series as a whole teaches that, the whole teaches us that the whole time, is that you don't expect people to survive. It never works. So we see Jon and Daenerys getting it on old school and uh, we see Tyrion down the corridor looking a bit worried and I'm not sure why that is maybe it's because he doesn't think it's a good match maybe it's just because he thinks there might be a potential conflict of interest there down the line because obviously Jon is so centered around his around his people and now that he's bent the knee to Daenerys obviously we know that back at Winterfell people might have a problem with that we know that, that Sansa did I am more interested to see if Daenerys and Jon are gonna have a really, really big problem with their relationship once they find out that John is a Targaryen and also Daenerys' nephew. Also, rightful heir to the throne. Um, so, I don't know what that's going to do in terms of how they continue with their relationship that they have already, and also what Daenerys is going to be like in terms of how she treats him after finding out that she that he has a better claim to the throne than her. I think it obviously it would also kind of connect the dots a little bit in her mind, that's why Drogon was so good with him. Um, when she landed and he was able to pet Drogon's face, you know, and she seemed a bit kind of, uh, wonder what's going on there. You know, how is that happening? But at the same time, Tyrion had a moment like that, and we haven't exactly got proof uh, for the theory that he is a Lannister. I, I, sorry, a Targaryen, rather. I mean, there's always the chance, but I think it's a bit far-fetched, and honestly, I don't, I'm not giving it that much attention. With this, Danny might get pregnant next season. You never know. I mean, we already had the, you know, the sudden pregnancy news with, uh, with, with Cersei and Jaime, and honestly, you know, the, the world could do with one less Lannister rather than one more. You know, I'd, I'd, pfft, dear. Obviously, the kid of, of Jon and Daenerys is going to be a, a, you know, it's going to be a strong one, but we're not going to see them get to the point where they grow up, but it would be a nice spin on the plot, especially once they kind of find out that they're related, so things might get a little bit complicated. Viserion, rest in peace. I still, I, I, in my heart, he's dead. I don't like seeing him being controlled like that. He was actually one of my favorite, well, I say one of my favorite dragons. There are only three of them, but the fact is, is that they're so underused, so they have a kind of, uh, they have a special place in my heart. Uh, because clearly Drogon is the favorite for Daenerys and that that gets to me a little bit But um, you know Viserion is breathing blue fire and that makes a lot of sense I don't think the Night King can change the inner workings of a you know of a friggin dragon just because he brings it back from the dead It doesn't really have that effect that, that effect But obviously blue fire is a thing and he's taking down the wall destroying you know that creation that was put up thousands of years ago by Brandon the Builder and you know in one fell swoop this whole army is is marching south very casually now that they've you know destroyed the wall and by the way rip Tormund and rip Beric Dondarrion now that the wall's been taken down they don't have anything to really struggle against especially now that they've got a freaking dragon as well so I thought it was kind of funny how in the final scene of of the episode which also was the only kind of big action set piece, really. They were just kind of mumbling along and, and, and they're just, you know, they're taking it very casually because, you know, they have a reason to be confident and I don't blame them. This season as a whole has been absolutely brilliant. I know a lot of people have problems with the pacing and how people seem to kind of teleport to wherever they need to be, but seriously, after six seasons of people barely moving, you know, it took it took Daenerys, you know, six seasons to get to get over the, the narrow sea in the first place. You know, aren't we all a little bit grateful to see that things are actually happening? I'd rather someone cut out the weight and, you know, a potential just, I mean, it, it would be cool to kind of see them in, you know, in, in progress on their travels. But besides that, I don't really want to see them take any more time than they need to because they've done that so much already in the first six seasons. I've sort of had enough of it. So actually, I've really liked the pacing of this season because things are actually getting done. And I understand, therefore, why they've lessened it from 10 episodes to seven. 
because they don't need to drag it out as much as they have been in the past. I mean, I'd rather they had three more episodes to bring it back up to ten of, like, of the same thing of what we've had this season. But again, if they have, like, a certain part where they're going to be stopping in the plot, there's no point in trying to add filler episodes and that sort of thing. You know, the, it might just be completely unnecessary to have these episodes that really don't impact the plot that much. And if they have, as I say, if they have a specific point, they have designed it or they no, they, they plan out the number of episodes that they need to get to that point and have it be a done deal and that's where it ends so I'm sort of happy that they're doing that because I don't want to leave this filler but obviously I'm going to miss the fact that there are you know seven fewer episodes in this season and the next than, and than any other so as I say I really enjoyed the season as, as a whole I thought this finale was a really great way to round it off because Typical Game of Thrones is sort of ends with a bit of a cliffhanger, but it wasn't really a cliffhanger because we knew that something like that was going to happen. We knew that the the army that, uh, of the dead was going to get past the wall and it's going to obviously create complete havoc. And I think Cersei's going to realize that her decision to sort of hang back and let the others take care of it is a bad move. Because, you know, what I don't think what she realizes is that if they win, uh, the White Walkers can just, they can, or at least the Night King, can bring back... Uh, these people and and just sort of add to their ranks so if they're unsuccessful the rest of the country is screwed uh, and then the rest of the continent and the world you know it's it's something that they can't ignore and Cersei is doing her best to do that so if you liked uh, this video please give it a thumbs up uh, if you enjoyed what I was saying and agree with it then leave a comment saying what you did agree with or what you disagree with and what you liked about the season as a whole or what you disliked about the season as a whole but either way if you enjoyed it please subscribe to the channel so you can see more stuff from me in the future I might be doing theory videos in future that sort of thing uh, bonus videos just to kind of tide us over until the next season i know it's a while away but can never get enough game of thrones so in that case i will see you all in the next video take care